I would like to translate the title of the museum because it's interesting. It's actually translating as Museum for New Art. So it's not a museum of modern art or contemporary art. And I always find it fascinating that, that it's beyond art historical categorization. It's a little bit more free. And because it also brings the question of what is new for whom? So this question of perspective is something that we will also refer in our conversation later on. Um, the video and film works that we will be speaking are actually being currently presented in showroom in the museum in Freiburg until 5th of August 2020. So if you're around southern Germany, please come by. Um, and uh, so showroom is a small cinema space inside the museum. It's an experimental room. And I want to a little bit give, uh, give an idea how, how it is in the museum. So when you enter the museum, the entrance floor, there is the collection presentation. And the second floor, uh, there, are te there is temporary exhibitions. And only when you're at the top floor of the museum, there is the showroom. And I, I also quite like it because you see everything in the museum and then you are on the top floor, like you're digesting everything you're seeing. And that it's kind of also, it's like entering a different world because showroom often has its own curated program. So first of all, I would like to tell more about the artist, the Amel al Uh She's an artist from Syria based in Al Leipzig, Germany. Al, Al Zakut. Al <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from, uh, so she's based in Leipzig at the moment. And uh, Amel is working with different sorts of mediums. She collaborated with forensic architecture for the specific work in the program, Shipwreck at the Threshold of Europe. And her film, Purple Sea, which she did together with Khaled Abdul Wahed was shown at the Berlinale Forum Expanded this year and also won the film prize of the Robert Bosch Stiftung 2018. Christina Varvia, she is deputy director of forensic architecture. She coordinates projects, assembles teams, oversees research and development of new methodologies. She is also a member of the Technology Advisory Board for the International Criminal Court, which is quite interesting. I hope she can tell us more about her role there. She studied architecture and is currently teaching unit master for diploma at the AA Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. And Yazan Khalili is architect and visual artist, lives and works in and out Palestine, his works have been exhibited in several major exhibitions, including New Photography, MoMA 2018, Jerusalem Lives, Palestinian Museum 2017, and Shanghai Biennale in 2016, where we actually met for the first time. Uh, and also Sharjah Biennale 2013. And also for the people who are watching us from uh, Germany, his work, uh, Medusa, was also recently shown in Kunstwerke in Berlin. And Patrick Lose, Patrick uh, studied photography in Essen and uh, based on strategies of documentary, his artistic works refer to themes and narratives that are usually underrepresented in public discourses. In recent years, the focus has been on the topics of racism and prison. And Patrick Lohse was the director of photography for the film, The Second Attack, Der Zweite Anschlag, directed by Mala Reinhardt. It's an, it's an excellent documentary film about recent racism in Germany. Also through this film, we got to know each other in Karlsruhe. And uh, Ole Christian Haya, uh, is a photographer and artist based in rural area in Germany. Among photography, he also studied uh, geography. He received an education prize for mementography of a failure, failure together with uh, Nafize Fatolzade. Uh, Fat 
Since 2016, he is a member of Artistic Community Macroscope Center for Arts and Technique in Mülheim. For the work Dunkelfeld, which is part of the program, he worked together closely with uh, Patrick Lose and Marian Mayland. Uh, with his work, uh, he is focusing on human perception on environments, the ways in which the media, such as photography, cartography, or film, can support our perception. So welcome again, all of you, and thanks for being here. Thanks for your time, and also everyone who is watching us uh, at the moment. And I would also like to refer briefly to the team of the Museum in Freiburg. You are not seeing their faces right now, but huge thanks to Christina Litz, Nora Persephone Johnson, and Luisa Moch, and also Andreas Berger for their spot. And of course, brilliant Mohamed Salami and Kasra Rahmanian from the new center. So thanks for, thanks for supporting and uh, making this event possible. So before speaking further, I would like to show the uh, first couple of minutes of the video works. And uh, Christina reminded me that I should uh, warn our uh, audience that with the forensic architecture work, there may be some uh, uh, disturbing images. So please uh, pay attention. So I will now show, share my screen with you, uh, host. So uh, Kasra, it says host disabled attendees screen sharing. Is it possible to make it possible? Yes, Edem, you're good to go. Right yes, now. perfect. Thank you so much. So, uh -huh. so I think it should uh, work now, or it's not uh, share. Geçen onlarca senede Almanya'dan çok insan aşırı sağcı, yeah. limit motifli işlenen suçlar yüzünden hayatını kaybetti. Kolluk istatistiklerinde bu tür vakaların sadece küçük bir oranı politik motifli olarak sınıflandırılmakta. Suçluların motifleri sıkça yeterince aydınlatılmıyor, örtbaş ediliyor ya da kaydı bile alınmıyor. Großbrand in Wannheimer Ort. Am 27.08.1984 gegen 0.30 Uhr kamen bei einem Großbrand auf der Wannheimer Straße 301 sieben türkische Mitbürger auf tragische Weise ums Leben. Nach den bisherigen Ermittlungen der Kriminalpolizei muss der Brand fahrlässig oder vorsätzlich entstanden sein. Wer kann Angaben zur Tat machen? Wer hat Personen beobachtet? die sich zwischen 0 Uhr und 0 Uhr 20 in der Nähe des Hauses Wannheimer Straße 301 aufgehalten haben. Für Hinweise, die zur Aufklärung der Tat führen, hat die Staatsanwaltschaft Duisburg eine Belohnung von 10.000 D-Mark ausgesetzt. Hinweise werden hier am Stand oder bei der Sonderkommission Großbrand Polizeipräsidium Duisburg entgegengenommen. Die meisten der rund 60 Menschen, die sich zum Zeitpunkt des Brandes im Haus befanden, wurden im Schlaf von den Flammen überrascht. Entstanden war das Feuer im Erdgeschoss des Holztreppenhauses. In wenigen Minuten hatte es sich bis zum Dachstuhl ausgebreitet. Dadurch wurde für die Hausbewohner der einzige Fluchtweg abgeschnitten. Satır ailesinin o akşam misafirleri var. Kız kardeşler Rukiye ve Aynur Satır, ara kattaki tuvalete gitmek için gece yarısına doğru son kez merdiveni kullanıyorlar. O ana kadar ne Rukiye ne de Aynur Satır merdivenlerde şüpheli bir şeye rastlamıyorlar. Ne bir koku, ne bir ses, ne de alev. Thank you. 
Der 20-jährige Suat Akkusch wird am nächsten Morgen in Süddeutschland ins Büro seines Chefs gerufen. Ein Mann erwartet ihn dort. In knappen Worten erfährt Suat, was in der vergangenen Nacht in Duisburg passiert ist. So this was uh, Yazan Khalili's work, and now we are watching the work by Forensic Architecture, and this is the work uh, that may be uh, disturbing for some uh, viewers. On the 28th of hmm. Sorry, I think my internet is a little bit uh, overloaded right now. Maybe I should refresh.
On the 28th of October 2015, at the peak of the long summer of migration, during which one million refugees crossed the Aegean Sea, a ship carrying over 300 refugees from Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Kurdistan, the West. So sorry for the technical. I think uh, my uh, internet connection is being a little bit. Uh, in the Greek. Let's the see. Was. What we can. Okay. The shipwreck resulted in the death of at least 43 people. More people went missing, the fate of whom is still unknown. One of the passengers on this ship was a Syrian woman called Amal al Jakut, traveling with her friend. Amal documented her route using a wrist mounted waterproof camera. Her footage captured the crossing from the unique perspective of those drowning at the maritime borders of the European Union. Now based in Berlin, Amal asked forensic architecture to help reconstruct the incident and its aftermath. Together, we try to understand how such a deadly shipwreck could occur in a narrow strip of water so densely populated and heavily monitored by EU agencies. We looked at the actions of those involved, smugglers, national coast guards, the European border agency Frontex, as well as civilian rescuers, such as local fishermen and activists. Our analysis shows that this tragedy is the result of government policies that intend to police and repel migrants rather than setting out to assure their safety. Because her camera occasionally switched off, Amal's footage includes a sequence of 21 clips with time gaps in between. The time encoded in the camera's metadata was incorrect. As a result, we could only sequence her videos and establish their relative times. By sampling a vertical strip of pixels from every frame, we reconstructed the visual diagram of each clip. The color, reveals all the moments that Amal's hand was underwater. In one of Amal's clips, we see the smugglers abandoning the vessel. The smugglers promise that for the fee of 2,500 US dollars per person, the crossing would be undertaken in groups of 50 traveling aboard a large boat. Instead, they packed an old wooden boat with more than 300 people and sent it out in rough weather. The smugglers embarked on a boat called Kaptan El Edermit that took them back to Turkish shores. Meanwhile, they forced one of the passengers who had no previous experience at sea to steer the migrants' boat towards the Greek shore. As the wind... <coughs> We had a little glimpse from each of the works presented in the in the program, um, and uh, I would like to speak briefly how this program came together. So the title of the program, "Hiding Our Faces Like a Dancing Dancing Wind," and the the program is revolving around human rights urgencies. And, and it's not that, it's not that uh, there was first the concept of uh, human rights issues and hiding the faces and that I search works around these topics. It was rather an organic process. Um, Yazan Khalili, I know him uh, uh, since the Shanghai Biennale. It's been uh, four years and I basically always wanted to show this work because I find it very uh, poetic and political at the same time. A work which is about new technologies and colonial uh, legacies. And I was very interested in the work for a long time. And then, uh, and then I was visiting Berlin and I've seen the work by forensic uh, architecture and, and I was basically completely speechless after after seeing it very it's a very it's a very strong work and at the same time i was in contact with patrick because they show uh, mala and patrick were in Karlsruhe, part of a film a screening program here and i've seen the work the second attack uh, and i got a call 
call from from Freiburg. So it all came together very very naturally, uh, basically. And uh, so my first question will be addressing all of you. Uh, so each work is addressing to the current human rights urgencies, crime against humanity or violation of basic human rights. The video work of forensic architecture, we, we see in the work that for Frontex, European Border and Coast Guard Agency, is failing to react and take proper action during a rescue operation of a, a shipwreck in Mediterranean Sea, just by the European border. And in Patrick Orla and Marion's film, Dunkel, Dunkelfeld, we're watching a story of an unsolved case of a racist murder in Germany. And uh, Yazan's video, which is giving the title to the program, is problematizing the face recognition technology and drawing parallel lines between this technology's racism and colonial legacies. So could you tell us more about the method in your work and especially the way your work is dealing with uh, these urgent human rights topics? And uh, I would like to begin with uh, Christina. Sure. Hi, everyone. Very good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, um, I guess uh, this particular work might be kind of a unique case for us, but um, so I, I'm not sure whether I, I should address this, uh, this question as in principle or, or uh, for this one. In general, as uh, many of you might know, we do uh, forensic architecture does is a research agency. It's based in a university. It does um, it does work in human rights violations and um, environmental violations. And the way that we work usually is that we receive an invitation uh, by someone, uh, a kind of group on the ground, a local organization, um, in order to analyze uh, an event of violence. And and so what we do at this point is try to figure out what material exists, uh, what, what are the holes in, in, in this material, what doesn't exist, what are the main questions, um, what could we offer with the very particular tools and techniques that we have developed, which are technological, which come from, from uh, particular disciplines from the architectural world, but also the filmmaking world, uh, the software development world, um, journalism, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's it mainly every time that we get uh, a request to look at a new case, we we somehow kind of need to figure out whether we are the right people to do that that sort of work, because we need to figure out whether there's an open question that that is um, is appropriate for us to to answer um, a spatial question usually. In this particular case, um, we had had a, a very kind of different starting of the project and. Um, I kind of we were very lucky um, that somehow the, the work itself developed through, if, if I may say so, a, a friendship with Amal and um, that came through actually a different project which somehow relates to the work um, that uh, Patrick and Ole uh, are presenting um, in, in its thematic. It was a work that was presented in, in Germany. It, it was about um, another racist murder by the group called NSU and there we worked with Amal's partner and from there we, we got to know Amal and, and, and the, this amazing material that she had gathered and, and essentially her story which is one uh, that you know she can't uh, speak for herself uh, but it is one that, that is quite um, an incredible story to, to get to know and of course here the question again um, came what could we do and what could we offer in 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 such a case where it was one of the deadliest shipwrecks in the history of the Aegean Sea uh, in all of all of its kind of um, um, history of migration and uh, it's a history that we keep seeing today uh, being even more um, kind of uh, than than the military measures that are in place now are even more harsh than what they were in 2015. So just today, there was um, talk about raising a, a kind of a fence along the sea. So this is, this is in a way, um, our method there 
um, similar to our previous cases, but also different, was to, to understand what this material that Tamar had gathered meant, what, what does it represent? And obviously, as, as you will have seen from, from that material, it is incredibly strong because it offers this perspective that we usually don't have. Um, in high resolution and incredible quality, but also from from kind of capturing that that um, that uh, event from 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 a perspective of someone who is in the sea. And so our job there was to because also Amal was doing her own film that I think she should talk about. Um, but our job there was to try to to kind of um, complete that vision. So not not just. Um, extract everything we can from, from our footage, but also um, try to figure out what other cameras we have, what other witnesses we have, so that we could piece together a, a larger picture of what was taking place. And through that work, be able to criticize not only the actors that were present, but the long lasting European policies that have left people unaided at a time um, where there has been a, a kind of a really um, tragic shipwreck, and so the work is, was is essentially what we usually do is try to uh, work from a particular incident and and do that forensic work, analyzing and and kind of dissecting with as many tools as we have, as as advanced technologies as we need to learn to to do that work and then try to understand how that particular incident connects through a whole series of structural um, uh, structural uh, uh, issues of violence, uh, structural racism, structural inequality, uh, policies uh, that, that are meant to marginalize, that are meant to, to basically lift who has the right to, to be protected under the, the kind of human rights that we all understand. Um, should be uh, should should belong to all of us. So that that is a little bit of our technique, maybe. Yeah. Thank you, Christina, for this insightful uh, answer. Amel, uh, would you like to tell us uh, about your collaboration with uh, forensic architecture? Of course. <laughs> First, uh, thank you so much for having us. I mean, it's really nice to be with you. Um, I think it's, it all started in, in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, when we uh, first, uh, when we decided to do something with this material, just going back a, a little bit further to the, the, the trip and uh, how did it start and the, the filming idea, it was meant to be a, a kind of a, um, a memory for, 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 for me. And uh, when I, I mean, when, when I uh, took the decision to film this trip, I never uh, wanted to do a film out of what I, I, I will film. I mean. And, um, and I, of course I wanted to share it with Khaled also, my partner who uh, you mentioned uh, as a, um, a, direct, a director in the film. But uh, I think after the incident has happened, I mean, the, the, and the camera has filmed, and I, I like to say always that um, after the incident has happened, the camera has its own perspective. I wasn't controlling what the camera is filming, so I was busy doing something else. <laughs> so it's basically uh, that perspective was unique even for me. So it wasn't something really you can just uh, turn your face from. And um, that, at that moment we decided, uh, we haven't seen the footages directly. It took us some time. I mean, for me, it was different, for instance, than uh, Khaled, but uh, um, we, it took us some time to, to show uh, the footages incomplete and to start to sharing it with, with friends. And, um, as Christina said, uh, they were wor working on this NSU uh, tribunal. Uh, when I've, I, ha I have seen their work, and at that time we were uh, thinking of a legal act, uh, how, how to use these materials for a legal act. This is what's the, the, the most important thing. And I, I've seen their work and I, I really liked how they deconstruct and reconstruct the crime scene and how do they, 
uh, uh, worked uh, uh, with with other people. Like this was really amazingly done. Uh, like uh, the people who are involved in the story and with other artists. Um, and that at that moment, I felt like this is the the right. Uh, moment to discuss this together and they came over they they, they have seen the uh, footages and um, I was I mean I was sharing it with friends not with uh, um, forensic at that moment so that's why it felt really um, right to 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 talk about it yeah and then it took us uh, of course some time to uh, to get to the point together where we want to start at that time, in parallel, we were working on Purple Sea, the film. Uh, so for me, it was this. This was something very important that I wanted to talk about the the story, the the incident, uh, as a as an artist. This is something I like to do. This is what I know how to do, and I didn't want to go for. I mean, um, um, what forensic. Uh, is doing that is their uh, method as Christina said so it's something that I mean I'm not uh, this is not my, my part of my 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 work of how how I, I work so it was like we are completing each other it's not uh, just we are putting uh, different uh, pieces well well thank you so much for this collaboration and and also generosity I uh, it's it's obvious that the material it's it's not an easy material and uh, but thanks so much again to forensic uh, architecture and also uh, Amel to make this public to make this uh, this incident public and uh, Yazan I want to continue with you when we were speaking on the phone the other day uh, about your work and you said something you know like the state is recording you but anyways i was just think, uh, thinking about it but um what is your take on this uh, the relation with we, uh, we are worked the human rights audiences in the times of where the state is watching you um first thank you for this invitation and uh for being in this group and for this discussion this is my first webinar and uh, it's a bit of a scary feeling that um, the whole world can be listening. Um, actually, uh, the other day there was a lecture in, uh, done by a group in Jerusalem about the situation of the Palestinians in Jerusalem. And suddenly, uh, uh, one, um, it was an open uh, webinar. And when there were the Q&A, uh, someone, uh, interrupted and said, uh, uh, hello, I'm uh, Captain Gabby from the Israeli uh, uh, um, Secret Services, and um, we are recording you and watching you. Thank you for your uh, -na -na -na. And he left. And, um, and, and I think this is a very, you know, like, um, you know, just thinking of all this technology and this kind of openness, and like now we can speak about whatever we want and online and everyone can watch it also allows you know um, uh, the state and it's, it's um, okay let's say that was a very special moment usually um the state is hiding it doesn't show itself you know like the the secret service it's we know they are recording collecting data and they use uh, they're using it whenever they need it against you uh, and we are i would say we are somehow um fine with that at least we're fine until uh, um, until it suddenly shows itself, you no? Know? Like that moment when this um, Shane Bait, I don't know, Mukhabarat, uh, Israeli Mukhabarat, um, showed himself up and declared that he is, they are watching, he is watching. Um, the whole apparatus of being watched, recorded, the, how the whole apparatus of um, 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 collecting the data um, suddenly shows itself up and we are not fine with it anymore. And we're scared and we see it and we feel it. And it has a face, it has a sound. Uh, you can link it to someone. 
and stuff like that. So um, why I'm saying this because like I'm, you know, we're on this webinar and I'm just thinking, you know, like who's watching us? Um, and I guess, you know, like um, 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 when, like when I began working on uh, hiding our faces, like a dancing one, like when I began working on, on that video, um, uh, the, the whole question for me was about um, um, this moment between you want to hide your, um, your face, um, but you also want to be recognized. This word of recognition, you know, um, 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 maybe as a Palestinian, our whole struggle was about recognition, to be recognized as humans, to be recognized as, as a state, as a nation, as people on the ground. But now this idea of being recognized is somehow uh, something that um, uh, um, um, it, it, it captures you. It captures you through this recognition. It, it, um, it, um, it, um, you don't want to be recognized. You don't want um, uh, to be recognized by the machine, you know? So I was working between these two moments of recognition, the recognition as a political act and uh, being recognized as a security uh, act by the apparatus. Um, and therefore I was looking, I was trying to look at the history of, uh, or to tap on the history of facial recognition through uh, colonial um, um, uh, anthropology and, you know, and how colonial practices uh, in, in the colonies about measuring faces and to, to identify who's a human and who's not. And, and through that human rights, uh, maybe later began to develop this idea of the human. Um, uh, it also began with this measuring the human face, no? um, to decide who is a human and therefore um, has um, either better rights or then they will be exploited in a certain way, let's say. Um, so I was trying to look between these different histories of, uh, of the history of the face, the history of um, uh, the facial recognition, the, um, the history of measuring and the history of hiding as well. Um, 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 so, um, um, I was trying to put all of these together. So I'm, I'm not responding directly to human rights violations now, but this uh, whole uh, apparatuses of, um, uh, and mechanisms now of um, uh, uh, facial recognition, you know, um, also bring up these, it becomes a question uh, that you cannot avoid when you work with these, uh, uh, apparatuses. Mm. It's, it's not like you can work with them and just talk about it aesthetically only without yeah. indulging with it politically. And yeah. Yeah. yeah so, well, thank I, you. I no, yeah. no, it's, it's great. Actually, it's, uh, it's great that you already, you know, mentioned about the recognition. And I was already thinking in relation with Patrick Orle and Marion's, Marion's work, because in Dunkelfeld, it is about also the recognition of what had happened. And uh, yeah, so I would like to hear your take on the, on the uh, question. Patrick, do you want to start? You should un unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah, <laughs> so now. Thanks for the invitation and sorry for muting. Uh, yeah, as you said, it's um, with our case, like what Dunkelfeld is about, it's inverted, like the Satir family from Duisburg, uh, for them, it was really hurtful, like all these years, like 30 years now, uh, without any recognition of their case, there was, um, after a few weeks after, after the arson attack, it, was completely silent about the case. There was um, no public debate or nothing. Like, they was just along with it. And um, 
So that was my first association uh, when I read the title of the program. So that we have here the, the one side of trying to avoid it, but on the other side, there's something who's maybe made silent. So it's something they, the family is somehow also feeling like uh, they should not be seen, like they're trying to make them silent. Like the city, for example, um, they don't accept to, to rename a street, for example, or they, um, they, it's, it's not possible to, to make a plague at the, the house where everything happened. So today you can go there, you can visit Duisburg, you can go to the house, but there's no sign or no trace. You can't see anything of, of the case of the history of that place that seven people died and what the backgrounds are. And um, yeah, that's something that's making all this even more hurtful for, for the family, but by not being recognized today. And, and Ole, you actually worked closely. You were in contact closely with the family members. So how was, how was your experience uh, being involved in this uh, film project? And also this responsibility of uh, being in a close dialogue with, with the family, perhaps developing friendship, relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting. First, uh, I'm very happy to be here as well. And um, the work with a family uh, was, um, I think, a work in progress, uh, of course, because we met uh, two times at the beginning to have a basic information to who is the other and uh, you know to to get to to know uh, the the team of the initiative as well um for us i think um yeah we took a lot of time to develop the script of the uh, uh of the film first and um for this i um had phone calls with the family or wrote them via email to get their response and feedback if how do they understand the script do they feel be recognized are they represented is their opinion is what they think is the most important aspect is this inside of the script in a way that the family feels expressed in it I think this was uh, yeah, one of the most important things for us and to reach this goal, um, yeah, we, we met um, not every week, but uh, in every, every period after, uh, you know, main goals are reached uh, to have a basic and an honest um, yeah, way to handle it. And there was always the possibility for the family to say, uh, no, this part is not as we feel or something. And um, so, yeah, there was, was a good and open uh, conversation. And uh, yes, beside, beside this case, which is uh, like Patrick said, uh, 35 years ago and such a long period of silence and not being heard, um, we talked a lot of, of, of about the past, but uh, as you said, uh, there is a personal connection, and uh, yeah, we, we we feel like uh, friends or in a in a friendly, open connection. Yes, valuing each other. Mm. Thank you, Ola. Um... I would like to focus now a little bit on this, this act of hiding faces again, because uh, while I was working on the context, it became a very important metaphor. So I was watching Yazan's work, and then at the same time, due to COVID-19, this masks became mandatory part of our everyday life. So this was, of course, a coincidence, but it made me think about also different reasons hiding one's face so it, it was it was kind of like an anchor for the conceptual framework and that i was thinking of this like why why to hide a face 
because of shame, because of religion, because of maybe respect to other person or self-protection or being scared. So all these different meanings around the masks. So I know that each of you has a certain approach when it comes to hiding face or not showing the face or questions around visibility and visibility or different forms of mask. You kind of already in a way and um, answered partially all this with actually your your first answers, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Amel, uh, I want to um, I want to mention that in our conversations earlier, you said that it was important not to show faces of the people in the boat to respect for the individuals. So can you tell us about this decision? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, first, uh, I would like to comment on what, something uh, Yazan said. It's really interesting when you said, like, you don't want to be recognized by the machine, which is, this is how we are being uh, uh, seen these days. Like, you don't, you, are, you don't control how would you like to be seen. This is the problem. I think we, we we don't have a problem with showing our faces, but we have a problem how to show it or um, like how would would we like to be seen? So um, after seeing the the material, um, I was I mean I had a problem seeing myself there in the water in such a situation, um, and this is I think applies to everybody else. Uh, they have the right to be seen in the the way they want. Uh, so it was like something not really um, um, something that we cannot uh, discuss if we will show these faces or not. It's it was like all of us forensics and uh, Pong, our producers. It was together we 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 had this decision like we. Um, I mean, first we need to to uh, to answer the question why we f we show faces in the first place like what we are going to tell by showing the faces, this horror, this, uh, uh, um, I mean, it's everywhere else. I mean, we can see it now. We cannot, uh, we, we are see uh, 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 images coming from, from war zones. Uh, it's, it's horrible. And what does it change? I know that people when, when for instance, when you, when they uh, uh, talk about the material, when I, it's, say what, what has happened in the incident and the camera has filming and everything, they expect the, something big to happen. And this is not true. We are used to the, these images, to these scenes. So it was really important to, uh, to respect the, how do we be seen? Uh, and uh, also um, uh, the individual uh, um, perspective was very important. And when I say individual, I, I don't mean that um the story should be uh, told being told by the only the person who has experienced it which is totally wrong but it should have uh, the perspective of, of the person who had this experience who lived it it should has uh, the at least the the um, yeah i mean it's some let's say some some thoughts they thought people should put some thoughts behind uh, such uh, such um, uh, work. I mean, when when they want to work. So this is uh, it wasn't a problem at all um, showing faces, um, but it was like how how do you show it and for what reason? Thank you, thank you, Amal. And uh, so you referred to what Yazan said: the recognition by the machine. I want to continue also with uh, Yazan. So Yazan, in your work, um, uh, it's showing masks from ethnographical museum, uh, as far as we see, which is drawing clear reference between the colonial legacies and confusing this face recognition application. So in the context of your work, the act of hiding becomes also like the act of confusing. So it's kind of, uh, Kind of a counter uh, counter act uh, to the machine, let's say. So, can you tell more about your motivation and purpose by 
using the masks in your work and you also write a very beautiful text uh, which is also glowing in in the work um first in the um, uh, um, ethnographical museum the mask in um, is not um, 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 it's not a mask of, of hiding, it's a mask of becoming, okay? And this is uh, uh, um, the mask, how it's used in the ritual, how it's used in, uh, in, uh, in certain kind of practices in, in, um, in tribes or in sh shamanic kind of practices, is not a mask of to hide as much as to become something else or someone else or a, a diff, a, another character. Um, and um, I was told by some, you know, some researchers and was watching, you know, like these masks sometimes should have been destroyed in the practice itself uh, because they, con they, they are to, um, um, they are there to, um, um, to contain a certain amount of evilness that by the practice or by the dance or I'm, I'm sorry I'm not like using maybe the right um, um, ethnographical words uh, um, th that by the end of it they are either buried or burned or destroyed etc but when the um, Europeans came when the um, you know um, ethnographic you know, like these people who are collecting, you know, objects and um, um, and taking them back to the museums or to Europe to um, as, as as objects, they also stop the, the process of uh, becoming or of uh, of ending a certain uh, practice or a certain uh, legend or a certain thought or a certain story. You know. Um, so these, uh, I, I was trying to look at these masks as faces, not as masks, you know, and and this is um, um, and this is different than how we now look at the mask as something that we want to hide from the machine. But uh, in the text, I was like speaking that these faces were not recognized as faces, uh, and that's their dilemma. That's their. That's why they are stuck in this history, in this kind of time and in this um, presence. Uh, some of them, I'm not, you know, I'm, uh, each mask has its own history and its own story and its own uh, practice that uh, either stopped or continued or et cetera. Um, and so th th these, these masks, uh, th these faces were, were not recognized as, as as faces, they were taken. They were put as masks outside of their uh, context. Um, um, and I was then I began thinking of, of of that, working with what is um, um, a face? How can a face become uh, something else? Um, how this kind of movement in front of the face can hide it? Uh, can create another face? Um, uh, a face that is hiding without disappearing, so it's not like I'm 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 covering. You know, I, um, it's it's Lara, my partner, who is um, standing in front of the of the machine in the video. Um, uh, so she she was not trying to um, disappear, uh, but rather she she was still there, very you know present. But um, it was a moment of when the machine could, cannot see cannot see her anymore. Right? So, uh, so she was trying all these kind of uh, dance performance in front of the machine that the machine begins to fail to um, uh, to see the face uh, while we are still looking at it. So, and therefore these are the, these many screens that you see the. Um, um, I'm recording um, the mobile looking at the, so what you see is, is not only, you see what the machine is seeing. Um, so the, the, the yellow square you know, around the, the face is this kind of the, how the, um, um, the machine exposes its presence 
through this very little box that puts them um, around the face. I don't know if I'm answering the question or... Um, yeah, no, it's, it's great to hear about the, the process of, of uh, making, making the work. Uh, yeah, and just to say, like, and, and, and it, it's something, oh, yeah, and, and it's when I went to the museums that I wanted to take a photo of the mask that the camera, the, the screen of the mobile gave me a yellow square around the, 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 the mask. And, like, it suddenly somehow became a face, you know, like, what is, what, what, what is recognized by the machine? It's faces. And so uh, there was this kind of, for me, like the, the, of course, the, the machine is confused, but I also got confused um, about this moment of when the machine begins looking at the mask as a face, and then you put in this historical context around it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, it's great to know all this, uh, all the all the process and the artistic logic and things that are happening around while while making and thinking about the work. And uh, Patrick and, and Ola, you mentioned that in the case of your work, uh, instead of hiding the faces, the visibility is much more meaningful and necessary. Uh, so you already mentioned that because the story, the tragic story that you're telling with your film is like almost absolutely invisible. So can you tell us about uh, the other strategies? So you you uh, did this wonderful film, but there is also an Duisburg initiative. Can you tell us about like the other um, activities or um, things happening to, to make it more visible? Who likes to answer, Ole, Patrick? Um, yeah, okay, unmute. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I remember very well the moment when, I think it was uh, after having a final script and then we started to have the, um, we needed to try yeah, to, to find images to express, to give the story, the, the, the off voice, a, a visual uh, component. And this was, um, yeah, on this we as well took a lot of time to, to, to find the right surrounding for the story. So uh, not a clean neutral surrounding, but not a site-specific uh, site surrounding as well. And during this process, uh, we asked the family what uh, uh, example for the end of the film. Uh, we asked what is what's their wish, what is really missing in 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 their history, in their family history, and regarding uh, to the future, what can change something. And it yeah was very clear clearly said that uh, there was that there is nothing on the, uh, or around the house or at the place where this attack happened, which remind to the um, uh, seven people who was killed and that there is no visual sign, um, yeah, which, which remember, um, what happened and that there was that, yeah, um, uh, th this unclear moment was the most sad and or one of the most sad things they mentioned uh, what is missing today. But there are also like more and more um, uh, calls or petitions and I think awareness of visibility uh, to give like street name or maybe like more articles uh, in newspapers. And I think with your film, it's also, uh, I think here uh, playing an important, uh, playing an important role. So therefore it's also, I think quite uh, important. Um, 
I would like to turn to Amel uh, to hear a little bit more about the process because you know what I'm what I'm always thinking is that you are such a crucial collaborator, like ex existential part of this work. Basically, if you didn't take this trip from Turkey to Europe, this work wouldn't exist at all, perhaps. So it's, it's a matter of life and death and it's definitely not an easy material to deal with. And uh, I can imagine there have been a lot of decisions to take while making this work and uh, to, to, to basically to digest and to make it uh, respectful for everyone without victimization, showing the horror as you already said. So can you tell us a little bit more about this long-term process, uh, collaborating with, uh, with forensic architects? I know you already answered it, uh, and answered it with the first question, but I would also like to speak about Purple Sea. Uh, so for the people who don't know about Purple Sea, Purple Sea, it's um, a film done by uh, Amel and Khaled. And uh, the, the film is not part of the program, but you also made this uh, Purple Sea. So I, I would be very happy to hear uh, more about how Purple Sea relates the whole process. Yeah. Um... As I said, it took it took us some time to 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 see the footages. So uh, if you basically count, uh, I mean, I, I came to Germany in 2015, and the film and uh, the two films, the investigation film and our film, has been done in 2020. I mean, like premiered. So it's five years basically, and it's long time. But I think it deserves every <laughs> every second of it because. Um, it was very hard to first to face the material, to um, to look at them, to process, to share them with friends and um, uh, like uh, family. And then it was really hard to um, to know what to do with them. So I said that we had this urge. I had the urge to do something with them, but I knew it's it's. Um, it's a um, different kind of urge. It's the legal uh, uh, urge that I wanted some to blame someone why we have been left in the, in the water for almost three hours and who to blame. Like, is it the smuggler? Is it a Frontex? Is it somebody else? Um, and also like, uh, this is not only the story I wanted to tell. It's not that I came from nowhere to the sea. <laughs> so I have past, I have, I have life, I have uh, uh, a reason why I came. So all of this together made, made us like think of the two options, the, the film, the investigation film option and the and purple sea. And actually it's not only these, um, Christine also knows about the uh, text. We have a text written by, by a very dear friend uh, called uh, Merle Kruger. And the text is about uh, uh, the text has been uh, written before the the, the two films actually, and all these work. I mean, when I said it's very, it was very important to talk about the individual uh, perspective. Uh, I meant to really to work in in, in collaborative uh, kind of work like um, such. This is also what I've seen in in uh, Dunkelfeld such cases, such, such stories, I think cannot be done by one person. They need to be really uh, um, collectively um, uh, worked. So um, Purple Sea started also um, as uh, we started together, me and Khaled, uh, my partner. Um, both of us were really, I mean, Khaled is, his perspective is very important in this film. Um, maybe my, my perspective is, is really the, as you said, like there, there won't be material, but his perspective is really very important as he, he's the one who's waiting. This is the perspective of the one who's waiting the other. And um, uh, the fact that I wanted to film this trip for him, this was also very important. So 
the film is kind of, um, it's a poetic film, it's a documentary, poetic film. Um, and I can say it's a kind of uh, love letters <laughs> to the, as you like to describe it. But also it's, um, it's the mindset of the one uh, who's, who's in, in that situation. It's not facts about what's happening or what we are seeing or not seeing. It's a fact of what we are feeling more, like what do someone in this situation feels. And for me, this is, for instance, a very good, very, very important perspective. But I, I definitely know it's a very good perspective and important perspective to talk about the facts what happened, what, what really has, uh, uh, why um, uh, uh, they were neglecting for this situation, why uh, we haven't been rescued all this time. So here, I mean, as we said, when uh, forensics work came and uh, it was, I mean, what I really liked uh, the effort they did with um, bringing the whole, um, the other um, witnesses, let's say the people who, who filmed people, who, who recorded people who were involved in the rescue operation. So it's really, I think both work are uh, important at the same level and different uh, perspectives. I mean, I urge everyone to watch Purple Sea. It's uh, really, I had the chance to see it for the first time today. And uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was crying basically, how, how by, by the strength of it and, uh, and the, the editorial decisions that, that you're seeing first the sea and like, and like the way I really felt like at that moment you were thinking about Khaled so it was like really I felt like it's like a love love letter almost so it's uh, so I really urge everyone to try try go and see the purple sea um Christina I would like to uh hear your voice I I understand that it this has been a long commitment and the incident took place in 2015 and we can watch it five years later. So there is a reason behind it. It's a very careful fact-based work. So can you briefly summarize what happened in this last five years and this collective working process and editing various materials from different sources and collaborators? Yeah, I mean, I guess, um... I guess uh, Amal also described it very well that um, we met in 2017, and um, so we didn't didn't really know that this material existed before that. But also uh, in the beginning, when we were talking about it, uh, I think in the beginning uh, Amal and Halid were thinking about it as as a as one work together, right? Because there were two Amal had those two tendencies, like try to figure out what happened and be able to to kind of tell that story from, from her personal perspective, which I think is, is a very unique one and, and has a lot of value. And I think at some point we realized that there's a little bit of a tension between those two things, even though it doesn't have to be. I think, um, I think it, was, it was, at some point it was decided, I think mainly by Amal, to, to just do it as two separate projects. And the interesting thing is that the, the the process took so long, not so much because it took long for us to do the kind of the analysis, which of course it, it did, everything that we do is very labor intensive, but it was also kind of a process of dealing with the material and figuring out what is the appropriate way to work with it, right? Because it is very personal. It's not, it's not something that, um, it's not a journalist that has taken this from a distant perspective. And so there was, there was kind of a, trying to figure out also that medium. What is that? How do, how do we do it in two different ways, and in a way that it becomes a, a constructive way to both deal with with uh, trauma, either kind of a, the primary trauma of, of Amal being part of the, that incident, or the kind of secondary collective trauma that was basically everyone 
from Lesbos who were was witnessing that incident, everyone uh, still talks about the 20th of October 2015 as that moment where it really changed things. It really felt um, very different because of, of, of what was going on, the, the intensity of the, of the subject. So um, I think also maybe going back a little bit to to this idea of, of the mask and, and, and the idea of, of, of hiding faces. At some point when we were talking with Ahmad and Khaled, uh, Khaled was telling us about uh, his perspective of waiting, as Amal says, and seeing that dot on the GPS, like this single dot, and, and trying to figure out how, um, how that dot in a way becomes, becomes a, a kind of a single incident or becomes a piece of data and the way that that um, the European uh, kind of um, states are dealing with people going through such an intense journey with so much texture and emotion and, and, and intensity, and it gets translated into a number of people who died, a number of people who arrived, a number of people who are kind of coming in to invade, full quotations invade, uh, Europe as, as migrants, etc., and and there was some there was a necessity to break that uh, apart and to also think about how the the whole idea of a migrant is really built on the, the idea of a criminal, historically speaking, right? The idea of of taking identification, capturing the fingerprints, uh, measuring, doing all of the facial, all of the recognition irises, everything you do now when you cross into Europe is built up on technologies that, um, that were built to understand criminals. And so there's a question of how do we, how do we um, um, like dismantle that narrative? How do we um, take apart that whole way of, um, of speaking, that whole way of, of, um, of understanding those incidents? And also I think that's why, um, Perhaps if I if I can go on a very small tangent, um, you know this idea of hiding faces was maybe in this particular case a, a bit more straightforward because we we had a mouth consult and you know her um, her intuition is would be kind of much more representative of what people wanted. But we've worked in other cases, for example, in um, in a rescue operation from uh, in the central Mediterranean from Libya to to Italy where. We, we were working with, uh, we didn't have access to a witness and we were working with uh, people who again were, uh, were drowning and the question of blurring the face really started picking on us a little bit on what is this idea of people without faces? Does it play a little bit in that narrative of the faceless criminal that is coming here? And especially coming with people coming from, from Libya, this idea of black bodies being thrown at sea somehow it was a little bit uncomfortable for us, the connotations with obviously the slave ships of people being thrown in the water because they are faceless, because they are not considered as, as human. And this is, this is something that made us really uncomfortable. Yet when we had to think about um, who are these people now and how could we take this decision for them, even though the, the aesthetic choice of not showing their face, not showing their humanity was, was not what we would have preferred. We also couldn't take the decision for them to say, we need to show their face and to show their humanity because we don't know their personal circumstances and whether they would be happy with that. That is kind of, sorry, a small tangent of the movie there and why I went all, all the way there. But just to go back to this idea of, of the number and that basically this idea of dehumanize, dehumanizing people um, and treating them as numbers. I think that when, when we had those conversations, I remember a moment where um, we were talking about how do you deal with this dot on the GPS and how do you deal with this very powerful footage from one perspective and the absence of everything else. And so we decided, you know, this is a, an incident that was recorded. This is an incident that happened at the height of the so-called migration crisis, there, it's the sea, the, the space between those two pieces of land is almost like an amphitheater. It's an incredibly uh, visible space. And so there's, there's footage there and there's, there's material there and there's witnesses there that we would be able to complete that picture. 
And so it's not to say that you, at any given moment we have all of it, but the attempt was to try to piece together and to, to give, I think, I think I remember also this, this moment where we're talking about the helicopter, no? and the anger of the helicopter filming, and that, that kind of desire of seeing what the helicopter sees, right? Which we couldn't replicate because we, we couldn't get that footage, but just being able to zoom out into the model and place everything together, it, it was the closest we could offer in, in kind of providing like an overall picture. Thank, thank you, Christina. I think it's uh, like referring to, you know, like when you say like, you know, black bodies thrown at the sea and like this whole dehumanization. And I think it's extremely important to uh, to think about these issues and, and also who is representing who and how. And uh, with this question, I would like to speak about Dunkelfeld. But I actually forget to mention in the beginning that uh, we are uh, happy to have uh, questions from the audience. So we have a very interesting question to Yazan, but I would like to first uh, uh, speak about Dunkelfeld and then we can also open up uh, to Q&A. And uh, if anybody has a question, so feel free to write in the chat box. Um, so Patrick and, 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 and Ole, I mean, now thinking with what uh, Christina said about this questions of, uh, you know, the, the humanization and representation. Um, I mean, for the ones who didn't watch, uh, watch the work, I will just want to wrap up like the work Dunkelfeld revolves around the real life story of family Satir in Germany. And uh, in the in the mid I mean the eighties, seven family members were killed due to a fire uh, in their own houses. Uh, Ferdane Satır, Songül Satır, Çiğdem Satır, Ümit Satır, Zeliha Turhan, Rasim Turhan, and Tarık Turhan. So German invest investigation department says that the fire must be caused by neglect or intent. But later on, it becomes clear that the house was actually set on fire. And even the perpetrator confessed that she set the house on fire later on. She is seen as a pyromaniac or in German, it's Einzeltäter, uh, not politically motivated. Uh, so although racism, xenophobia and right-wing extremism in Germany is a quite urgent uh, and contemporary issue, it's rare to see a work of art and films about this issue. It's not that I'm saying it's not existing, but it's rare uh, to see them. And even if there are, there is a problematic of how can you talk about racism if you, or make a work about racism if you didn't experience it yourself. So in your case, it's a collective work and you've been in close conversation with the family. And, and also I find it really good that the work is the two languages. It's switching between uh, Turkish and, and German. So I would love to hear from you the challenges that you face and the, the things that you paid attention in terms of uh, speaking for whom and questions are around representation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this question. Uh, at first, I would like to talk about the first question you asked, like how can you talk about racism? Um, and yeah, of course, that's something. I mean, me or us as a white person, a male white person, we can't talk about what it means to experience racism. I mean, I would not even try to. But what we can do is, is listening. So uh, listening to people who are affected. So, and in this case, we had to listen to the Satyr family. Um, they were our main source for like, before we writing the script, as Ole mentioned, uh, we had meetings with the family and we asked them what is important. Like we were not trying to create something like truth or evidence, but it was more important like to find out what perspectives they have on the case, like all this over 30 years later. 
And this was the, the important questions before starting to go to, to make this film. And, um, and the whole process was based like on these moments of conversations. There was like all the time we made phone calls, we meet again, we showed them like the script and discussed this with them. So this, this is what I mean with, with listening. We have we had to try to um, to involve them in the process and not not tell our own story of how we maybe see it. And um, I, I also saw this as a kind of, of research. Like um, normally, when I when I do an artistic work, it's a lot of research at first. But in this case, it was not really possible because there was no material you could research because there was this very few um, like newspaper or from TV clips, but. Um, that was not really helpful. It was just, um, you could see something about the time, like how was spoken about uh, migrants at this time, for example, that was something that came really up to us. So that's the reason why we used it. Um, and all this process was not ending by like asking them what is important, but also, um, before publishing the film, showing it to them, discussing it again, and also at the premiere of the film, uh, involving them in the Q&A, so just not representing ourselves with our work, but also uh, putting them with us. And I think another important thing is the way of representation. If we had just told the case and ended up with the fact that seven members of the family had died and um it's that they might be represented just as victims um, of this violence and the social silence following it and that was something really important for us not to do so that's why so that's the reason why we really put something at the end where you see a part of the family on a stage and um, speaking and the very last scene of the film is um, we're showing the street sign they are asking for um, with the family name on it. It's something they're trying to get. They, there are negotiations with, with the city of Duisburg. And I think this is one thing they really demand, like putting a place or something that remembers of all this, like of the family's drama that happened to them. And this is something I think that was important just not showing the, the moments of, of the hurtful moments of violence, but also what are they asking for and showing them as speaking persons, a powerful person, they have demands. So that's, I think, what's really important about the representation. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So we have two questions from the audience. Um, the first one is addressing Yazan. Uh, I think it's from Sabih Ahmed, by the way, also from the uh, team of uh, uh, Shanghai Biennale that uh, we were both involved. So uh, he's asking, Yazan, you brought up a beautiful point about histories of being captured that are con uh, conti contiguous with histories of hiding. Can you share more about what a history of hiding would look or sound like? When can a history of hiding be written? Can it be written by those who are still in hiding or only after they are no more hidden? Can it be written from the position of hiding given that this may compromise the position of hiding? More fundamentally, can we see history eye to eye from a position of hiding? Mm. <laughs> Why do you ask these questions? <laughs> um, I, I actually, the other day I was walking um, here in the street uh, near where I am now, and um, I looked at a shop and I remember that someone told me that underneath this specific shop that I was in front, there are, um, um, uh, leaflets hidden 
okay, from the first intifada. So someone, you know, brought it up once. And, um, and it's, of course, like, uh, like there's styles now and everything. And it's, it's, it's a shop, yeah. It's not, you cannot just like go and dig in the floor and to find these leaflets. But maybe it is um, the history of hiding is told through legends, through urban legends, through, through myth, through stories that people tell each other about things uh, that can never be, you can never be um, sure of, but you can only somehow um, um, believe because um, um, I guess the history of hiding is so much about it continuing to hide. And I don't mean um, um, in a way hiding is in relation to power and in relation to, um, you know, how do you not allow power to, um, to catch you or to, to, to capture you or to um, recognize you, you know, like all of these acts that makes you subject to this power. So in a way hiding and, and the history of hiding is a history of resistance. It's a history of refusing uh, uh, any power or power as such to, um, to be able to uh, uh, subjectify you or to, you know, like um, capture your presence. So hiding is in thing, the, the story, the, the, um, the, the position of hiding is to continue hiding. And it only can be known through narratives um, that doesn't have clues in them. They are just um, um, urban legends. Like, and it's like, in, in where I live in, in, in Ramallah, it's filled with such urban legends. A building that hides um, uh, novels under its uh, bases. Um, the building that, uh, the, the land that has weapons buried in, the, in it. You don't know where are the weapons. You don't know which piece of land, but there's the stories of, of, uh, you know, of militant people, of fighters who hide their weapon. And uh, you can never find these things, but, but you know it's there somewhere. And you know that the story is true, but it can never be captured. So maybe this answers Sabiha's uh, uh, question. Thank you, Sabiha, for this. Well, the other question is um, from Marius. Uh, I would like to ask something concerning the work uh, by forensic architecture. Was there any comment or reaction by any political officials from European Union or Frontex after you make the work uh, public. By the way, three great works. Thanks for opening my eyes more. Thank you. Um, a short answer is no. <laughs> There's many ways that uh, we've uh, gotten uh, pushback in, in many different cases. In some of the cases we are looking at most recently, um, again, in the same border, the Greek Turkish border, but up north in the Evros Marriage River, um, there where there has been also killings, there has been outward and, and specific uh, position of the Greek state that completely denies being involved in any uh, kind of uh, violent uh, threat. Uh, but in this particular in this particular investigation, I think partly because um, it was uh, five years ago, partly because it's a different government, uh, partly because it, things are so much worse now than what they used to be in 2015, unfortunately, there has been no comment. Um, not that we won't try to provoke one, but um, at the moment the reaction was silence and silence means burying it. So, if uh, anybody wants to comment or add anything to things that have been talking.
I was, I mean, I was uh, thinking of uh, what we've been discussing. Uh, actually, Amel, I want to uh, hear your voice again. Um, to, you know, like to speak about like this perspectives, who is speaking for whom. And for me, it's also interesting how you, how, uh, how is uh, your, like, tell us about like your artistic practice in Leipzig. I know that you're uh, studying there. You lived two years in Istanbul, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, how is, you know, to Elizabeth also come back from this heavy topics, like how is, how, how, how is like uh, studies, life, life in Leipzig? And uh, also I would like to hear more about your uh, personal artistic uh, practice more in the work that you're doing. Sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good way to go out of um, <laughs> all these um, heavy stuff. Uh, yes, I, I moved to Leipzig with my family uh, like a one and a half year. Um, I was in Berlin before and I, I, I applied to, to the HGB, uh, Hochschule of Buchkunst in Leipzig. And uh, I'm studying media kunst now, uh, which media art, which is, um, I mean, something I really like because I don't... Uh, I don't work in one medium. I like to work with different mediums. I um, I consider myself as a puppet maker. I make puppets, not um, oh. for the sake of showing them in an exhibition or something. I have also, they have, uh, for me, it's an ongoing uh, work. Like I want, they have characters. I write about their characters. I wanted to include them in, in, a, in a film. Uh, I'm still like, um, uh, hesitating between a film and an installation. Uh, I've also worked uh, um, in an inst installation with Khaled as well. Uh, and it's somehow related to um, um, what happened in 2015, but it's very personal perspective and very abstract. It's something like there's, um, it's like a still images. Uh, um, this is how I like to describe it. Sorry for the sound. <laughs> and um, uh, what else? Um, I mean, I, I paint uh, not uh, in, in a regular basis, but I like to paint as well. Um, but I know that, I mean, I am going more toward the uh, video art filmmaking. This is what I like to do. Uh, we've done lately a film uh, about uh, coronavirus, and it was an interesting project for the uh, the MDR has made this competition for artists in Leipzig and in Saxony as well. To um, um, to how, I mean, it was for them to for the artists to show their work in such a crisis and such a difficult times. Uh, so it was also fun to 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 do this. Um, yeah, but usually, um, as I said, I, I like to work in different mediums. Thank you, Amel. I'm also personally very happy to to meet you and to to get to know you. I think we have a lot of things to talk about, like life in Istanbul and coming to Germany and. Uh, and all that. So I have last two questions. I think they're like... Uh, I, I figured out that I haven't uh, answered your question about the uh, um, uh, representation. And Oh, yes, that's true. I think like I, we've talked, all of us, we talked enough about this, um, but maybe uh, to clear something that I don't find a problem with, uh, because I mean, what you you asked before for the Donkelfeld team, uh, about uh, like how you could speak about racism if you don't experience it. Uh, I think it's, it's, it is important to talk about something that you are not experiencing if you are um, part of it like in somehow. And what I see in Dunkelfeld is like, uh, it's equally important to, uh, because they took the, the uh, Satir family perspective in a, the most um, uh, good way and at the same time, we cannot uh, uh, ignore that 
I mean, they are from Germany. They are they are living in Germany. This is their country, so they need also to to talk about this is their perspective as as well. It's it's not only uh, a one dimension perspective. So uh, I think it's it's uh, how you represent. It's how we represent things. It's not like uh, who who's allowed to. It's not like an ethical question. Um, like what does it mean to you, and um, how how to to communicate with uh, the people who are who you are representing uh, them. No, thanks for adding that, uh, Amel. Because uh, while Patrick was speaking. He said something very important is that I'm, I'm listening. So I think it's very important to acknowledge uh, the privilege, not facing racism in everyday life, but also to to listen. And I was like, if if everyone could listen more, I, the world would be a better place, uh, I suppose. Um, so I said I had two two uh, brief questions. Uh, so actually the, the, uh, the first one is to Patrick and Ole, because the Dunkelfeld, the English speakers probably don't understand it. So as far as I know, Dunkelfeld is a political terminology. Uh, of, uh, how can we translate it to English? So can you talk about the title a little bit? Well, um, I think the best translation for Dunkelfeld is dark figure, maybe. Yeah, it's a it's it's a term of uh, criminology, I think. So the undiscovered or hidden cases uh, and the number of it. This is what. Yeah, maybe to. Uh, to compare it with an image, it's it's the number of cases, attacks, murder, or um, which is uh, still in the dark and hidden. And this dark area is something like a field or a, a figure, and it's dark. You cannot know how big is the number of these cases. It's maybe the only way, uh, it's like a cave, you know, to find a symbol, something like this. It's hidden. And this is the meaning of the title. Thank you. I, I think it's, it's, it's good to know because when you think it's like Dunkelfeld, it's uh, the, the black area, but it's, uh, but it's actually like a term that has been used to, to address the issue. So my last question is to Yazan, because I'm personally very curious to, to hear about it. So when I, when I watch your work, because you also said the work is uh, working like a visual poem. So it has many layers, screens, and I'm kind of like obsessed a little bit about this, like writing this, this text, the act of writing. And uh, I found it so beautiful. I actually want to read the first sentence. All the masks that disappeared from our lives were not recognized as the face of our ancestors who came from faraway shores was our dreams. So I want to hear your uh, way of thinking around literature because like working with like a lot of artists, like I know people would like be saying, oh, the text would be too much. No, no, not this one. I feel like people are sometimes so like hesitant or scared. Oh no, there is this layer, this layer, like less is more. But I really enjoyed this, this text. So uh, can you tell us more about your decision um, adding this text uh, to the work? Um, first of all, I, I, I love working with with having text with the images. Um, I think it um, uh, having a text helps to, and it works well with images, like it, it, it also takes them away from, um, uh, you know, 
this endless possibilities, like it, it puts them somewhere. But that's not the right answer. Um, I work with text, but I don't work with sound. So I, I mute my videos. So there's no sound in the videos. There's the text that um, is usually, um, um, you know, it's a condensed text. So it's not a huge, um, it's a paragraph, a sentence actually, without any break or any, it's one continuous sentence without any apostrophe or, 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 um, or stop. So it's also kind of an endless, a, a very tiring act of reading of a very condensed short text. Um, uh, and I do, and so I do that. So the, the, the sound that the person hears uh, or listens to while reading is their own sound. There's no, no other sound um, except the surrounding, but the video itself has no sound. Um, so this, I feel like um, this creates a certain kind of poetics of the sound, you know, like you are reading uh, each person will hear the, um, their voice um, reading this text, even in silence. So the video will, every video has the voice of its a viewer uh, with it. Um, uh, it's an attempt yeah, to work with, with, with such kind of um, intimate voices or personal voices. Um, um, and I work with text because I, 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 I like words. I like to, to think of, this, of these videos as visual poems as well. Um, especially when talking about um, a very um, um, contemporary topic, very, uh, usually it's approached from a very technical, scientific, uh, um, uh, point, you know, like a, a approach, um, uh, visual recognition because about the camera and about the, the software and the algorithms and 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 it becomes something untouchable, you know, like it's very hard uh, to to think of it to 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 um, to be able to comprehend it as a. Um, uh, I'm someone who's totally bad in technology, and so so I always I began feeling that um, poetics allows us to think of ways to resist. Uh, uh, it makes it um, um, uh, resisting it becomes closer to our humanity, um, to our weakness, to our uh, inability sometimes. Um, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to do, um, 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 you know, I know, I know, I know the limitations of the artwork at the end. So I'm also working with this limitation of the artwork. I'm uh, accepting its limit limitation and uh, trying to to reach the limits of this um, um, of, of of the artwork itself. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the language came, comes as part of a bigger poetics of the image and the screen and the face and the words, etc. Yeah. Well, uh, what you're saying as a poetry as resistant, resistance is, I think, extremely, extremely important uh, when uh, when I watch uh, Purple Sea, for example, is that the, the script that is that is to me a poem, and like how how uh, basically how the script is is running, and and also Patrick, uh, we spoke about poetry. Uh, you, you actually made me aware of some uh, Turkish poems written in Germany that I didn't know. Uh, but I think we shared this topic uh, for a future discussion. But uh, I think it's uh, uh, also kind of connecting and important, basically, let's say, the 
the people who uh, who faced racism and that is kind of like or or who or any all sorts of emotions or uh, all sorts of emotions i think po poetry as a resistance is a very uh, i think uh, important important point i just wanted to mention that and um, so i would also like to uh, now ask if you have any questions to each other or any point to add uh, to to wrap up and i would like to thank all of you i'm now looking at the chat box and i'm not seeing uh, new uh, questions and answers so uh, there are people watching us so if you have any questions please be quick and type your uh, questions on the chat box uh, now uh, but if you have anything to add so please feel free to um, comment or add otherwise we're coming to the i think uh, uh, final final moments of uh, our conversation it's lovely to be with everyone. Thank you for organizing. Leslie, Krishna, thanks for all of you for your time and uh, everyone who's watching us also. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think uh, uh, so there will be the script of this conversation and uh, we are hoping to make it online. But before we're making it online, of course, there will be an editorial process and we will uh, we will share with you but i want to give you a space any comments uh, please uh, feel free okay so then then thank you so much again for uh, for your time amel thank patrick you. ole and also to marian uh, she's not with us uh, but uh, also to Marianne Mayland, not to forget, who was also part of the collective process for, for the Dunkelfeld. I think it's, uh, uh, to be honest, personally, I was uh, quite nervous because three works and all of you together, but it was uh, such a pleasure to, to hear the process and your, um, your artistic methodologies and your voices. So thank you for making it possible. Thank you, Dugan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks All for right. the invitation. Yes, pleasure. So we will we will be in touch for the documentation. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Bye. Everyone, good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.